I spent lockdown much like you people just looking at myself going, I am useless. I thought I was essential. I thought, the world needs my comedy. They need my jokes. No, apparently they don't, Rich. The world needs eyebrow threaders. You go sit in your shed and fucking plot your future. So to be able to come back, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Uh, I don't know if this is a, a, a makeup show or not. I don't know, it's just, uh, but it's, uh, uh, thank you, thanks. <laughs> I don't know what else to tell you. I was given a copy of the Daily Echo. That is a Pulitzer Prize winning organ. <laughs> Page one, you know, uh, anger over parking garage at a state. Page four, war! <laughs> Page 24, here's five new babies. I don't, uh, I think they're, they're struggling to, uh, maybe it should be the weekly echo. I'm just not sure there's enough going on in Southampton to uh, keep a paper going afloat five days a week. Holy shit, there is some weird stuff that's definitely non-news. And then around page uh, 20, they just run out completely and they go into the past. And then on uh, page 23 through the rest of the paper is basically just shit for sale that either elevates or uh, covers something up. <laughs> and there are uh, there are obituaries which I uh, I found those to be the most interesting part of the Daily Echo and probably the most researched articles. They really go into detail, but uh, I find it disturbing that everybody in Southampton appears to be dying either peacefully or suddenly. Those are your only choices. There's no other way to go in this town. Forget it. I don't care what you do. I'm going to get drunk and hold a match up to my petrol tank to see if it's empty. Nope, that's suddenly. You're suddenly, pal. I'm going to get hit by a truck full of chamomile tea. Uh, ooh, well, that's, that one's tricky. <laughs> Where are you on that one? They should be printing the unwanted pregnancy reports right next to the obituaries just to keep a sense of population balanced. Just use the same editor. Impregnated suddenly last Friday. <laughs> Martha Wilson in the back seat of a Ford Fiesta behind the Morrisons, congratulations. Dawn Johnson impregnated peacefully <laughs> at home, surrounded by family and friends. <laughs> it's great, it's great to get out, trust me, it's great to get out of, uh, it's great to get out of London, it's just great to, this is a, this is a great town. I like this town. I, sure I'm gonna make fun of it, but I like it. I like it, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's full of good people. And come on, it's the Mayflower Theater. There's some connection there between, I like to think, uh, my relatives <laughs> who did not come over on the Mayflower. <laughs> not remotely. Not remotely. You know, the Mayflower was kind of successful. There was, a, you know, the Lost Colony, you know this story. We were the first people to come to America. Boy, did they fuck up. They, uh, they went into Jamestown in Virginia, uh, went into a swamp and just looked at the swamp and went, this'll do. What the fuck is wrong with you? Keep going, there's rivers, there's mountains. Why the fuck would you settle in a swamp? And then they built a fort, uh, a three-sided fort. <laughs> One side open to Native Americans, Indians, attackers. Once, so roughly 75% of the Indians were repelled. And, uh, and then they found some tobacco and fucked off back to Britain. <laughs> and then of course the Mayflower. And the rest is history, ladies and gentlemen. Our glorious American history. Trust me when I say I prefer a British crowd any fucking day of the week now. Trust me, you are sensible people. I have no fucking, I'm not going to dwell on America for long because I don't know what the fuck's going on anymore. I, uh, I lost 45 minutes of material when Trump left office, so I'm the one who's hurt. I'm the one who's hurt. Not the Republicans, not the Trumpers, I'm the fucking one who's suffering. I had 45 minutes of glorious low-hanging fruit that I could come out and kick off the stage into people's faces every night, and now it's gone. I can't make fun of Biden, nobody knows if there is a Biden. They trot a guy out who looks like he came off of a Viagra ad and they put him out there in front of the lectern and he just says things and people go, oh, all right, fine, thank you. Thanks, Joe, thanks, Uncle Joe. He's fucking 78. 
He's 78 years old, you don't know what he's gonna say. Something to change the course of history, or he might just walk out and go, I think my nurse is stealing from me. <laughs> and I'm having trouble judging my distance. All right, is that it? Are we done? Right, right. He should just say the things that 78 year old guys normally say and then apply that to politics, because it would sound cryptic. It sounds like a cryptic genius. Biden, how are you gonna deal with this infrastructure problem in America, all the roads and bridges? Well, what you do is you take your tools off the shed wall and you outline them onto the wall. <laughs> and then you'll always know where your tools go. <laughs> that makes as much sense as anything anybody else has said. <laughs> Trump, uh, I think he tried to warn us about COVID, but he's a fucking idiot. Uh, like th two years ago, but he spelled it Kafefe, so nobody knew. <laughs> Might have been on to COVID, but it could that be. People say, what the fuck is it going on? I don't think it's asking the President of the United States to uh, learn to spell. Is that asking too much just to learn to spell? Who would tap my phone? He tweeted this once. Who would tap my phone? T-A-P-P. -P. This is the leader of the free world. T-A-P-P. -P. How do you fuck up the three-letter word, Trump? <laughs> Most of the letters are in your name there. It's, uh, it's tap, T-A-P, tap, T-A-P. Well, what's the big deal? People just stand up for him. Extra letter, what's the big deal? <laughs> the extra letter is the difference between wiping out crime and wiping out Crimea. That would be the difference in one letter. <laughs> extra letter means black olives matter. There's a lot of difference in one letter, so <laughs> fucking learn to spell you. And it Boy, he seems like he seems like an old-fashioned fuck up, doesn't he? Let me tell you something about Putin. I read this yesterday. Dumped his wife in 2014 in the middle of an opera. The more I hear about this guy, the more I don't like him. <laughs> that was a nervous response. <laughs> it's, it's fucked up. It's just like, Jesus Christ, uh, COVID. Uh, hey, we just kicked COVID under the table. Oh, great. Fucking war. Great. The world is just fucking limping along from one fucking breakdown to another, ladies and gentlemen, like a pantyhose on a fan belt, just trying to make it to the next fucking service station and get a wee fit, for fuck's sake. I wake up every day, you know what I feel like now? You ever see a car go down the road with like four arms, each out the window holding a mattress onto the roof? That's the whole fucking world right now, people. I don't know how to make sense of anything. I thought, I, I thought these guys, are, they're done. Don't they, doesn't Putin know how it fucking ends? He's in a culvert with no socks. That's how they're gonna fucking find him. <laughs> just gonna, just, what a piece of shit. <laughs> what a piece of shit. I don't know, I'm trying to follow this whole thing and you know, you just, you know, there's tons of news stories, but uh, some of them are like, what the fuck's going on here? So they captured Chernobyl. <laughs> <laughs> I think they would have given him Chernobyl. I think they would have given him that. And they don't know where the Russian Navy is, but they know where all the super yachts are. And, uh, you know, it's always just tit for tat stuff with Russians because, you know, Britain has, they gotta be, who knows how fucking tied in London is to all this shit. So it's always some kind of tit for tat stuff. Well, we'll do something and you'll do something and then we'll do something. We'll take, uh, we're gonna take RT off the air. Nobody fucking watches RT. Meanwhile, the fucking meerkats are all over the fucking television. Get rid of those pricks. <laughs> meerkats aren't even Russian. What the fuck is going on? Some dodgy fuckwit animal in a cardigan and a pipe is trying to steer me towards some weird insurance company? Fuck off, Russia. <laughs> when the, after the Novichuk thing, right? Remember? I remember this story. I read this. It was like, uh, uh, like nobody quite knows how to deal with this, so, uh, this is the story I read. So the uh, UK has expelled 25 Russian spies. So consequently, Russia has expelled 25 British spies. Just like spies, just 25 spies. Just rounded up the spies. Surely the first rule of being a spy is no one knows you're a fucking spy. How <laughs> do they just go to 25 different guys and tap them on the a spy? What? I mean, what? <laughs> get out! Get out of here! It just goes on and on. This is why comedy is important, ladies and gentlemen. For the next hour and a half, you won't have to confront all the shit going on in the world, except that I'm talking about it. Other than that, <laughs> that's the beauty of comedy in this country, ladies and gentlemen. I don't quite know what to make of America anymore. I just do fucking Democrats hate the Republicans and the vaxxers hate the anti-vaxxers and the fucking truckers hate the border patrol. I don't fucking know. I just, I look at this country sometimes and think, you are a sensible people. 
<laughs> Run by idiots, but sensible people <laughs> under the command of genuine fuckwits, right? But you just kind of get on with it. Brits just don't, they don't freak out. They just, they don't, you don't grab a gun and go shoot someone because you're pissed off. That's America. Have a nice day, then they shoot you in the fucking head. That's, there's no gray area in America. Have a nice day. Thank you. <laughs> Whereas Brits are just like, just put up with it all day. It just boils and boils and boils. <laughs> just, it just gets stupid and tired and it's nothing until you hit the fucking melting point. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> I've been pushed in the brain by a not responding to what happens after I post it. He's going to get me. Fuck that, put that. Fuck it, man. Why is it? Why is it? Why is the post box welded shut? What the fuck is going on? I, uh, I, I've been coming over here a long time, and I, I've kind of, I've, I've never quite figured out Brits, and I'm glad, right? Because I, and the reason is, is that you can never quite figure out what Brits are thinking, because you're polite, but you're evil, and, <laughs> and you're happy, but you're miserable. Like both, in the same instant. Only Brits can be happy and fucking gloriously miserable at the same exact time. They make chocolate for that. Yes, I would like a chocolate. I'd like an Aero Bar, please, because I want something that's gorgeous and delicious and beautiful on the outside, and on the inside, empty. <laughs> just emptiness, just nothingness, just a big chocolate harmonica of despair. Do you have anything like that? <clears throat> Not linear people. Right? You're not A to B people. I was sitting on the train just watching this person go through a cryptic crossword puzzle. Just like that. Like fucking cracking a code. Just like... I just, I don't, I've never figured out one fucking clue. And yet Brits just look at Well, that makes sense. Put that there. Put that there. That makes sense. Um, you're not linear. Northampton is fucking nowhere near Southampton. That's the... That's the longest cross-town cab ride in my life right there. <laughs> I was in an Uber last week. This is only in Britain would this happen. I don't even know what the guy was thinking. I was in an Uber cab. So the driver, of course, is over here on the right, steering wheel on the right. There's the window. I'm over here in the back seat on that side, and I told him I needed to go to South London, and I told him where I was going, but I, I was late, and he could tell I was in a hurry. And this is what he did. He's just driving, and he goes like this. Don't worry, I know all the shortcuts. <laughs> Shortcuts. Now you don't even know the shortcut. The point now that you know all the shortcuts. You're not like I can't quite figure it out. I don't. You're like etch a sketch people. Everything is just crossing over and it comes back. And, ah, race and start over. This is why Brexit was never just going to be a fucking empty lot. Well, we come back. We're over there. We come back. We come back. You don't. You're not like that. You're not like that. There's a great term called direct action that Brits use. It's a form of protest, but they'll tell you, no, it's not protest. It's direct action. Well, what does that mean? Well, I'll give you an example. There's a lot of people in council housing and they're very poor and they need insulation. So in order to make that happen, I'm gonna glue myself to a road. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't think of anything more direct than that. I think, boy, that's really addressing the problem. So they need insulation, so you're gonna glue yourself to a fucking highway. That's right. That'll, that'll put insulation into those lofts. No, it fucking won't. All you're doing is holding up traffic. Who's going to pull, pull out of a three-hour traffic jam and see some fuckwit glued to a highway and go, why is he glued to a highway? Well, obviously, people in council housing need insulation. <laughs> I, was, I was talking to these guys. They're all over London. I like to talk to them. I asked one guy, I said, because this is what I was curious about. I said, there's actually a glue that sticks human beings to a road? <laughs> That exists because I'm like, where can I get that? Because I've got a lot of broken stuff in my house. That's the kind of glue I need. And they said, it's just industrial adhesive. Uh, we get it at B&Q. <laughs> <laughs> really, you get that at B&Q. You go down to B&Q and buy some industrial. Hey, I got an idea. Why are you down there at B&Q? Why don't you pick up some fucking insulation? <laughs> huh? Take that back and glue it to people's roofs and need it, you fuckwit. Why are you gluing yourself to... Better yet, you and eight of your buddies stick their fucking selves to the ceiling. <laughs> Try to get through the winter. <laughs> but I love it. I love it because it just doesn't make any sense. And yet, yeah, that's what we're going to do. I'm gluing myself to a road. I'm helping out the cold folks. <laughs> it makes it wonderful. That's why you have the best sense of humor. This is why 
This is why I'm playing the theater, proper theater. Oh man, I told people back in America I was playing the mask. They fucking went, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> That's like the Radio City Music Hall of Britain, isn't it? Yes, it is. <laughs> right down there on the coast of Southampton. Fucking beautiful. And uh, because uh, during lockdown, uh, there were various attempts to try and uh, keep comedy going. And it was fucking horrible. <laughs> horrible. I did a drive-in comedy gig. Drive-in. Well, how does that work? Well, Rich, uh, we'll, we'll put up a stage outdoors and you'll stand on it uh, and tell your jokes and people will be in their cars. <laughs> what, they pull up in their car? Yeah, can they get out of it? No, they don't get out of their cars. They sit in their car. Well, how can I hear them laughing? Oh, you won't. Uh, but if they like you, they'll honk the horn. <laughs> I said, well, I'm pretty fucking funny. I'm going to kill some batteries. No, don't worry about it. And then uh, I did it, and it was awful, it was awful. At a certain point, I just realized, right in the middle of the show, I'm no longer a comedian, I'm just a guy yelling at cars. Like, I can, I can go up my own street and see that every day. It's just, I mean, God bless the people trying to keep it alive, but this is a two-way street, folks. Well, boy, it doesn't work without a fucking audience, trust me. I, uh, I did a show last summer, and this is how, I think comedy's changed a bit. I think, the, the, I think definitely the pandemic has like, uh, I don't know, I don't know, it's just, uh, everybody's a bit more uptight, you know, there's this whole thing about cancel culture, I'm not fucking worried about it, cancel me, I don't give a shit, I'm retired next year. <laughs> <laughs> or whenever I'm not funny anymore, I'm gonna quit, do something else, I don't know. But right now, I love it, this is my favorite thing in the world, just, I know, oh, you're blowing smoke up, no, no, I'm telling you, I'm willing to come all the way to Southampton just to entertain a half fucking full theater, I don't give a shit. <laughs> Beats sitting at home, trust me. I did a show in Livingston, Montana. Uh, it was an outdoor show, and uh, this was in August. So um, uh, I was a bit worried about, uh, I, hadn't, I hadn't been able to try out the new stuff I'd written, right? Like there was nowhere to try it out. And I'm nervous because these are, these are neighbors and friends who are coming to see me. It's not like you people, if you hate me, I don't give a shit, right? I'm not gonna see you, but friends and neighbors, I'm gonna have to see them right, you know, all week long, so I was worried. And uh, I wanted to try out some new material. And I said to someone, keep in mind, there's more people in this room than live in my town, right? So uh, uh, it was at a campground called Pine Creek, and there was great. There was like a creek, like gurgling past the stage, and there was mountains, huge mountains in the distance. It was like uh, glorious, right? It's like trying to do comedy at the beginning of a Paramount movie, right? <laughs> Distracting, actually. People were funny, funny. Fuck, look at that sunset. <laughs> What, anyway, what were you saying there, funny boy? <laughs> so I said to someone, is there any place in Montana, that, is there any kind of comedy scene in Montana, a uh, place where I could go try out some material? Because, you know, you got to do the new stuff. I wish I was a rock star and I could just keep coming out and doing my fucking old hits. Because that's what people want, right? Yeah, from the 60s and 70s. No, that's people. Just do the old stuff. Fan walks out. Here's something from our new album. Fuck off, do the old stuff. <laughs> Play the songs we grew up with, because we grew up with them. Because those songs are evergreen, right? They, they change meaning as you get older. A lot of songs from the early 70s are now about dementia. <laughs> Rock Stewart comes out and sings, Have I told you lately that I love you? <laughs> Roger Daltrey, who are you? <laughs> Two punchlines on the same premise. How about that? Let's go for a hat trick. Bono! I still haven't found what I'm... Oh! Look at that! It built in intensity! Three fucking punchlines! Man, I'm fucking kicking on all cylinders here tonight, ladies and gentlemen. I knew there was something magical about Southampton. So anyway, I gotta try out these few jokes. And someone says, uh, you know what? From what I've heard, if you go over the mountain there, there's a town called Bozeman, and I think they have a, like a comedy night that they're doing on Thursdays uh, where you can try out your new material. And I went, well, where is it? And he said, ah, I think it's at the Moose Club. It's at the Moose Club. Might be the Elks Club. Either the Elks or the Moose. One of those two. And these are like fraternal clubs in America where you go in to drink. They're basically bars where you drink, but there'll be, you have to pledge uh, allegiance to a stuffed animal, basically. <laughs> That's the only difference. Like a bar with a big stuffed animal head on the wall. The moose or the elk, right? And it's very disturbing. If you've ever seen a stuffed animal on a wall, then you know 
where you just start looking at it. Two or three drinks in, and you just study his face. <laughs> that poor guy. That look on his face is clearly the last thought going through his head. <laughs> and it looks like, is that a gun? <laughs> But they're like, uh, they're like fraternal organizations, and they always have function rooms upstairs. So they're across the street from each other. Here's the Moose Club, here's the Elks Club on Main Street in Bozeman. So I go into the Moose Club, downstairs, three or four old guys breaking and watching baseball. Upstairs, 30, 40 people, right? This thing is happening. Uh, there's no stage, but there's a guy with a mic, and he was looking hilarious, right? When I walked in, here's exactly the, the joke he was telling. He said, I remember when I was a baby, I was only six months old, and I was teething. But my, and my thumbs were inflamed. I was in a lot of pain. I was in a lot of pain, but I remember my daddy. I remember my daddy. His, his head just popped over the crib, and he had a bottle of Jack Daniels, and he just popped his finger in there and rubbed it on his own gums. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny. But no one else was laughing, and I realized it was an AA meeting, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> but I stayed for another 10 minutes because the guy was hilarious, right? He had great, funny, tragic drinking stories. And then I thought, oh, I guess the comedy club, because the comedy night is across the street of the Elks. So I go across the street of the Elks, and I don't know, there's a gathering there, upstairs, same setup, stage, lights. But someone had put a, a handwritten sign up on the door. And so keep in mind, this is sort of like re-entry COVID days, right? Uh, Although it is Montana, I don't know. Montana's been social distancing since 1842, so there's no real, <laughs> there was no real, but someone had put up this sign, and this is what it said, comedy show in progress, warning may contain anxiety triggers. <laughs> now, isn't that the whole point of comedy? To like fucking not be anxious for maybe an hour and a half of the day, you put up with shit all day, and then you go to a comedy club. Why would you put up a sign that warning, this might just uh, could set somebody off? And I asked the woman running the club, I said, what does that mean? And she says, well, we're thinking about re-entry anxiety. We're thinking about, you know, re-entry trauma. A lot of these people, they haven't been in public in, in 10 months, a year, and the comedian might say something that sends them off into some spiral of despair. What the fuck has happened to comedy? What the fuck has happened to the world? You just have to warn people about anything now? There are people in this room who didn't grow up with COVID anxiety. We grew up with fucking nuclear anxiety. We're about to go through it again. That's right. The Russians have a fucking nuclear bomb, and they might just drop it on you, Britain, or me, America. So I'm nine years old, and we had no fucking doctor come out and tell us, well, here's what you do with the nuclear anxiety. We had a fucking turtle come on television. <laughs> a turtle would come on and tell you what to do in the event that the Russians dropped a nuclear bomb. A fucking turtle. No background in civil defense. A turtle. <laughs> Named Bert. Bert the turtle. Animated. I guess that doesn't really matter, but... It was an animated turtle, and he would just walk out on the television screen, and he'd talk like this, you know, kids... In the event of a nuclear bomb, if you're at school, climb under your desk. That'll protect you. I don't think this turtle has any understanding of thermonuclear dynamics. I don't think he understands that a quarter inch of plywood isn't going to do much good against a fucking nuclear bomb. What the fuck? Where is this turtle getting his information from? Kids, in the event of a nuclear bomb, leave your shoes outside the house. <laughs> Don't track radioactivity into the house. Well, thank you. That also applies to mud, turtle. <laughs> Here's my favorite. Here's my favorite. Every week you come on saying, get rid of a nuclear bomb. Don't start rumors. <laughs> One rumor could create chaos. Really, a rumor is going to create chaos. You don't think that 400 foot mushroom cloud outside is creating any chaos? We're worried about rumors. Somebody's going to stagger in with their skin dripping off of them. I hear Rock Hudson is dead! Oh, fuck. Oh, boy. Oh, Jesus. It's just, it's just like anxiety. It's just, I guess that's just something we're going to live with. And I think you people handle it pretty well, you know. Everybody's got their own approach to COVID, and here it was nobody knew what the fuck was going on, and you're still all here. I'm presuming most of you are vaccinated because you're here. Because if you weren't vaccinated, you'd be home, crawling through the internet, looking for some fucking reason on why you shouldn't get a vaccination. <laughs> <laughs> Rather than just go, I don't fucking want a vaccination. If somebody said that, I'd go, yeah, fair enough. But no, 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 I'll tell you why I'm not getting a vaccine. I read all about it. It's a liquid SIM card. <laughs> what? It's a liquid SIM card that the government wants to, they want to be able to figure out where you are at all times. 
Okay. So you're gonna call me on your phone <coughs> after that? Because I can see where you are right now. <laughs> but just make 40% of Americans refuse to get back. 40% of Americans just say, nope, I'm not getting it. Well, why? Nobody's gonna tell me what to put in my body. I've seen what you put in your body, you fat fuck. You were at the steak pit last night eating a baked potato the size of a beanbag chair, all right? You crawled inside and ate your way back out of it like an emerging larva moth, you fat porcelain punch bucket. What the fuck do you care what you... You had breaded bread. You ordered breaded bread. Bread deep fried and more bread, and you're worried about what you put in your body. You got tattoo ink. You got so much tattoo ink under your skin, you look like an old comic book left out in the rain and you're worried about what the fuck you put in your body. Jesus Christ, get the fucking vaccine, you fucking idiot. <laughs> no, the Lord. The Lord will heal me. You get a lot of that. You get a lot of that. Uh, oh, I, uh, no, no, I believe in Christ. Christ, he healed the lepers, he can heal me. You don't have leprosy! You have a fucking virus. Get the fucking Jesus got jabbed. He got one in each hand. He came back to life three days later. Get the fucking jab. <laughs> Crazy. Crazy shit. This is the times we live in. That's why comedy is important, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> it is. Only in this country would, uh, would you, if you're a comedian, you are treated more like, you know, like, oh, BBC Four. Uh, regularly throws three-figure sums in my direction to uh, <laughs> go out and make 90 minutes of documentary about anything. It is rich, whatever it is. Just go out, research it, shoot it, we'll put it on the air. BBC4, right there. Ooh. I know, I made 10 documentaries. For B no one has seen them. There's more people in this room than actually watch BBC4. That's not the point. <laughs> the point is, at least it's there if you want to watch it. There's a whole channel just dedicated every night, like eight hours, to, to stuff going on in the world you didn't know was happening. Just watch it. You like Filipino tractor disasters? Here you go. Here's an hour and a half of Asian agricultural carnage. Look at all these wrecked John Deere tractors near Manila. Enjoy that. Here's the history of Tibetan throat music, part five. <laughs> Fuck, this is great. This is astounding. I don't want to watch Downton Abbey. This shit is great. And now here's somebody making Stacy Dooley cry. Let's watch that for an hour. <laughs> Four and a half hour film that nobody's ever seen. Four, what? Four and, a, four and a half hours. It's about a blind Afghan goat herder chasing a postage stamp across the desert. <laughs> who's in it? We just told you who's in it. A blind Afghan goat herder to stamp. It's four and a half hours. The subtitles are in Braille. Enjoy that and <laughs> pop off the evening with the top of the pops from 1981. There you go. There's Jethro Tull. Fuck me, that's astounding. That is, that is what makes Brits smart people. I don't know if you watch it or not, but you must absorb it, for fuck's sake, right? So, as America, we don't, uh, Christ almighty, we just, we walked on the moon. We walked, in my lifetime, we walked on the moon. Now, I don't know what the fuck we're doing. They shot William Shatner, and they shot an 80-year-old canned ham into space. What the <laughs> fuck happened? They just shot an 80-year-old guy. There you go, Shatner, enjoy yourself. He had the time of his life. He's fucking 80. You could have stood at the bottom of a stairway and held a fucking globe. <laughs> Sent him up on a stair lift until he got to the top and looked down on it. Bring him back down again. That was amazing. That was the most amazing space flight I've ever been on. So, uh, I've been coming here for, uh, oh God, I don't know, 30 years or so, and uh, yeah. Uh, over the during the lockdown, so I was thinking about this uh, this time that I was invited to uh, to meet the Queen uh, because uh, she was celebrating Americans who have made a cultural contribution to Britain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, but uh, I didn't think anything about it at the time. I was like, really, cultural contribution? Are you shitting me? Like, <laughs> QI. That QI, is that a cultural contribution? But during lockdown, they started thinking about that a lot. I thought, wait a minute, actually, I am essential. The Queen of England herself. And it almost set off, off an international incident because uh, uh, I, I'm sure most of you have probably been invited to the fucking palace to meet the Queen. So, you know, you know what it's like. I don't have to describe it. Uh, 
<laughs> no, I just got this thing in the mail. This big embossed card. You, Richard Hall, are commanded to come to Buckingham Palace to help celebrate Americans who have made a cultural contribution. And I showed it to my wife, who's from Liverpool, and she went, I don't know, this might be a scam. <laughs> <laughs> Give me that. No, oh, it's not a scam, it's embossed. It's from the Queen, from Buckingham Palace. I'm gonna get a fight them. Everybody's gonna get a parting gift there if we go. I'm going. And she went, well, you probably won't meet the Queen. I don't give a shit if I meet the Queen. I wanna see the inside of Buckingham Palace. I'll bet it's better than Graceland. And, uh, <laughs> and also because Don Johnson was gonna be there. Don Johnson, uh, some of you, some of you young people, <laughs> no idea. Hey, between 1975 and 1980, that guy fucking ruled Friday night television. That guy fought heroin dealers in no socks. <laughs> <laughs> Pastel suit wearing crime fighter in Miami. Holy fuck, I don't know what cultural contribution that made to Britain, but holy shit. I wanted to meet Don Johnson, and Ashley Judd was going to be there. And if you don't know Ashley Judd, she's a fantastic actress. She was in uh, High Crimes with Morgan Freeman. She was in Olympus Has Fallen with Morgan Freeman. <laughs> and she was in Kiss the Girls with Morgan Freeman. She is, next to Morgan Freeman, the best thing about a Morgan Freeman film. <laughs> And she's a Kentucky basketball fan. I'm a Kentucky basketball fan. I thought, I'll be talking Kentucky hoops at Buckingham Palace with Ashley Judd and hobnobbing with Don Johnson. I might meet the Queen. This is gonna be a fucking exciting evening. So I got all dressed up and I went. And uh, what I didn't realize was that, um, much like uh, Piers Morgan, uh, the interior of Buckingham Palace is mostly just empty parts. <laughs> It's just it's a huge, you know, the whole, I didn't know this, the whole interior, the quadrangle part, it's all just empty. There's nothing there. You just walk across it. You could be a tennis court there. There's nothing. There's shrubs, rides, animals. Be so, so you walk across this huge part. Then you go up some stairs. And then you're in this room. I think it's called the Blue Room. And, uh, and it's full of Americans. But there's so much. The inside of Buckingham Palace, there's so much, like, uh, like uh, frippery. Like, right, just... Every, everywhere you look, it's like being at a billionaire grandmother's house, right? It's like, don't touch anything. And all the Americans are nervous. They're, they're, they're not even moving. They're just talking to each other like this. We got a glass of champagne and a cocktail wiener with an American flag sticking out of it, right? They got that as you went in. And so everybody's just like this going, hmm, hmm, hmm. Place is wild. Don't, don't, I think I'm sorry on the carpet. I don't, I don't stand on one foot. <laughs> Everybody was like that, super nervous, except for Don Johnson. Holy shit, that guy was working the room. He was just like flitting from person to person. He was wearing a pastel suit. It was just like fucking Miami Vice. He had socks. He made the effort. <laughs> fucking a pal, so he's going to wear socks, clearly. That's the first thing I checked when he came over. He came to me and fuck, he's got socks on. This guy has made the effort. And he comes up to me. He goes, Rich Hall, you're a comedian. I know I've seen you on television in America. You're very funny. What do you think of Buckingham Palace? And I just said, I don't know why, I just said, I think it's tackier than Graceland. <laughs> I don't know why. And he said, what do you think, Graceland is tacky? <laughs> says, don't be making fun of Elvis, buddy. You're making fun of the king. Don't be making fun of the king. Don't be cruel. Don't be cruel. He did an Elvis impersonation, and then he wandered off. And so I yelled out as he was leaving, I said, Elvis, he's not the king, he's buried in his backyard like a hamster. <laughs> and some security people heard me say that. Now, I don't... <laughs> obviously, out of context, they just heard a guy about loudmouth American, the king is buried in his backyard like a hamster. <laughs> so there, this security guy comes right up to me, he doesn't even look, he stands beside me, he's not even, he doesn't even look at me, he just says, your name Rich Hall? I'm like, yeah. Uh, comedian? Yeah. All right. Yeah, right. If the queen says anything to you, don't say anything back to her. <laughs> <laughs> Walked away. I'm just standing going, what the fuck? They've been muzzled. <laughs> well, I don't have any. I'm, it's like I haven't written. I'm not going to be trying jokes out on the queen. <laughs> what do you think? I'm sitting at home. You know, the stamps don't do you justice, sweetheart. You are. <laughs> How many times have I licked the back of your head, lady? How many times have I... But I don't like being told I can't say anything, right? You know, she might ask me a question, uh, now what, I can't open my fucking mouth? And sure enough, we get in this line, there they are. They, uh, they move us into this other room with the big piano, the big piano room, which I'm sure had a lot of hidden speakers in it, right? And, uh, 
uh, I saw her, I saw Don Johnson down the line. She, she's, she meets him and she's just beaming. She's just like beatific. She's like, wow, like, wow the queen watches TV. Like, and I'm sure they're talking about episode nine, you know, <laughs> rocket and tubs versus the yacht. I don't know. But uh, I started thinking, maybe she just wanted to meet Don Johnson. Maybe this whole thing is just a pretext. <laughs> she can't just invite Don Johnson. She had to invite a lot of Americans, but she doesn't give a shit about us. She wanted to meet Don Johnson. We're wingmen. That's where we are. We're wingmen for Don Johnson. So we can meet the Queen. Prince Philip was there. He was alive at the time. That goes without saying, but he was there. <laughs> Looking fairly disinterested, you know. Uh, I'm sure he had better things to do. But they probably put some casters and ball bearings on the bottoms of his shoes and just uh, shot him down the hallway. Go make some yanks. <laughs> so he's kind of looking around, and then they get to me, and there's this greeter guy. That's what he does. His job is to say your name and what you do to the queen. So he stepped me up. Uh, your Majesty, Rich Hall, comedian. Clear as day, comedian. Prince Philip mishears this and says, Canadian. <laughs> And he does this move, like, what What do we do about this, anybody? Anybody? There's a Canadian infiltrator. There's a, I don't know what happened. I can, I can tell you what I imagine happened. The fucking SAS was moved in position, <laughs> trained their rifles. There's some AR-53 helicopters moved into place with some kind of laser-pointed radar beam on the back of my head. The Canadian intruder, only inches from the Queen of England at this point. I'm sure the corgis were rousted and hustled off to safety. <laughs> Probably had to wake Theresa May up. She was the Home Secretary and ultimately in charge of defense at the time, so they would have had to wake her up and tell her there's a Canadian infiltrator at Buckingham Palace. So that's monumentally embarrassing. She starts tendering her resignation, and then there's a whole Machiavellian kind of jockeying of buckwits trying to become the next Prime Minister. I don't know. Jacob Reese Mogg. Oh, that's gonna be me. Fucking haunted pencil or whatever he is. Um, <laughs> Six foot nine, fucking four. Uh, Michael Gove, oh, owl trapped in a centrifuge. These people could have. <laughs> these would have been your next prime minister, not the beloved Theresa May. <laughs> so, uh, uh, imagining, yeah, ima yeah, imagining the future scenario. I felt like I better clear the air here. So I looked at Prince Philip and I went, uh, uh, comedian. Not Canadian, Canadian. And he went, oh. <laughs> now, <laughs> the tricky part of this story is uh, there's no fucking punchline. <laughs> I know I built it up and built it up. That was it. That was it. I just said, comedian. He went, oh, I thought you said Canadian, and then I don't know what happened, and I guess the operation was told to stand down. And uh, <laughs> Theresa May went on to become your 54th Prime Minister. So, uh, yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> That's my essential contribution. Say, <laughs> allow that woman into office. Who the fuck knows? But at some point during the lockdown, I started thinking, man, that's nice to be told that you're a cultural contributor to something, you know? As uh, comedians, we're not really professional liars is what we are. <laughs> I just made that whole fucking story up. <laughs> no, that's not true, I didn't. But there's a lot of lying. There's a lot of conning that goes on, you know, because you want to be manipulated. You don't fucking want anxiety. You don't want to sit here and go, oh, is this going to make us anxious? No, you just fucking want escapism. You have to tell a few lies and there's some, you know, some selective editing of material. You say a certain thing and then you get to the punchline and that's all comedy is, right? Uh, people say, oh man, that's so true. No, it's not fucking true at all. It's a complete lie. <laughs> it's the best gig going, I'm telling you. I am like a professional con man, but I'm relieving a lot of people of small amounts of money. That's the only difference, man. <laughs> I love lying. I lie to strangers all the time because, you know, if they all talk to fans and stuff, it's going to be about comedy. When I meet someone who doesn't know me, holy shit, I can be anything I want, right? Anything. I'll just, I will tell the most outrageous stories just to see if I can get away with them. I was doing this show once, and uh, I had these books. I had these books called Sniglets. Uh, they were on the New York Times bestseller list. Now, Sniglets are they're like neologisms. They're like, a, is that the word, neologism? Uh, neolo. Oh, that sounds weird, doesn't it? Neologism. Neolo neologism. New words that should be in the dictionary but never made it. That's what they were. Like L acceleration. 
which is the mistaken notion the more you press the lift button, the faster it'll arrive. That should be in the dictionary, because everybody does it. Or if you're hoovering, car perpetuation, that's a word. Like you're hoovering and you run over a piece of string or lint about eight times, you won't pick it up. So you reach down and you pick it up, and you look at it, and then you throw it back down. And you give this hoover one more chance. Come on, that's way more common than petrichor, which actually is a word that nobody ever fucking uses. So I had these books, and they were called Sniglets, and they became really popular to the point where, like, sometimes the comedy clubs, they would say, Rich Hall, creator of Sniglets, and people would show up thinking I was going to do them on stage, but they didn't really work on stage, other than that one I just told you. Most of them were just, they weren't, it's the thing you read, right? But this is America. It's like, hey, the guy, the Sniglets guy. Hey, Sniglets, come on, let's go see him. My buddy's funny. And, um... I had to do this show at uh, Auburn University in Alabama. Auburn University in Al Two words that should be exclusive of each other. The university in Alabama. I played it. <laughs> Auburn University. And uh, I was on my way to, I had to fly to Columbus, Georgia to the airport. And then there's like 40, uh, 40 mile drive to get to Auburn. It's in the middle of nowhere in Alabama, right? So uh, I, uh, I was gonna rent a car, but it was homecoming football weekend, so no rental cars. So uh, I got a cab. Went out to the cab at the airport and said, I need to go to Auburn, Alabama. The cab driver says, all right, let's go. And he shuts the door, takes off. Four minutes later, pulls up in front of the bus station. <laughs> <laughs> the Columbus, Georgia bus station. He just pulls up and he goes, uh, here you go. And I went, no, no, no. I wanted you to drive me to Auburn, Alabama. He says, well, I'm not allowed. To, I'm not licensed to drive in the state of Alabama. I don't even know why. I was afraid to ask him. So he said, now if you go in there, there'll be a dispatcher in there at the bus station and they can get you a cab and take you to Auburn, Alabama. All right, thanks. And I go in and I tell the dispatcher, I need a cab to Auburn, Alabama. She says, all right, okay, honey. And uh, I go over and sit down and wait and buses are empty and people coming in and out, right? And a guy sits down across from me, he's wearing like braces, suspenders, and a starched white shirt and big old red face. And he's just kind of looking at me. But that's typical of the South. Everybody's giving you a visual credit check, right? So I wouldn't think about it. But I waited about 15 minutes and went back to the dispatcher and said, can you call the cab again because I'm going to be late for this thing. I'm... And he says, no, there's your cab driver. He's sitting right over there. <laughs> <laughs> I go over to the cab driver. I said, are you the cab driver? And he said, are you the fellow who wants to go to Auburn? And I went, yeah. He says, well, I guess we better be going. <laughs> I get in the back seat and we're driving along and he's not talking. You know, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, just passing red dirt and Confederate graveyards and stuff. And, and uh, he never said anything. And then finally, uh, all of a sudden, I just see his eyes in the rearview mirror. And he's going like this. And then you see him go, so what's going up there to Auburn for? And I said, for no reason whatsoever, because I read this magazine article in the newspaper, in the, in the uh, airline, Delta Airlines, magazine on the way down about this place called Redstone Arsenal, this top secret <laughs> missile facility in northern Alabama, Redstone. And it was a really exciting article. And uh, so I said, for no reason, I said, well, you know, I work up there at Redstone Arsenal and uh, uh, we're working on a Series 3 missile and it's, uh, it's kind of gone off course. <laughs> and it's headed for Auburn. So uh, <laughs> we're going to get to the uh, School of uh, Aeronautics to the uh, relay station and uh, reset the coordinates so that uh, it goes out over the Atlantic Ocean and explodes without hurting anyone. <laughs> <laughs> and the car actually swerved a bit. The car <laughs> and then the guy says, Ah, I thought all you did was in Sniglets. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say at that point? Well, you can't back down from a story that extraordinary. Hey, I, uh, do I open the car door and hurl myself out on the highway? Because I got no response for this. This is the best I could come up with. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, I do uh, work on those words when I'm, uh, you know, not doing important what, missile research? Yeah, yeah, missile research. And uh, also I do stand-up comedy. I might uh, I might put together a show while I'm up there at Open University. And you're willing to go, and you're willing to watch it, and then you could drive me back to Columbus. And he goes, nah, I'm going to get out of there before that missile hits. <laughs> <sighs> so, now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is what I think... How long have I been up here? Anybody, anybody got any? Is uh, 
4150. That's about that's about the right distance for a, a British crowd to go before they need a drink. <laughs> <laughs> and the second half of this show is going to be spectacular, folks. If there's one thing I know about South Southampton, it's probably the country music capital of Britain. <laughs> <laughs> Any of you here just put up, yeah, tell your jokes. You want some toe tapping, corn pone, country fried hit music? Come on. And the second half is going to, we purposely left some empty seats here for you to jump up and dance. <laughs> I could have sold out, but I said, no, people like to get up and uh, do some boot scooting boogie during the. So uh, uh, what we'll do is we'll take a. Uh, everybody happy with the first half? Like, yeah. <laughs> Really, you're going to end on an anecdote, Rick? Yeah, you're going to end on an anecdote. And what we'll do is take a 15-minute break, and when we come back, ladies and gentlemen,